of the, oops, this, um, it's north of some of the inhabited areas, but just south of the main part of the Amazon. To get there, however, you can't just go there. You have to go down to Sao Paulo, um, which is the, sort of the international port of entry. Now, just to get a sense of Brazil, oh, and then by the way, then you come up again um, to uh, along the way, and 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 then finally, so it's a, it's a three it's a three hop trip, um, but it's really not too bad as, as some of these travel arrangements go. Now, this is what Sao Paulo looked like when I first flew in there in 2001. Okay, when I was on, uh, you know, I was very interested to see what it looked like, um, and this this was the appearance of the city. Now we flew over it again on this on this last trip. This is what it looked like. Um, Brazil has not stayed static, um, in, in, uh, it's, it, it's, it's really grown apace. So you, you read about it, but until you see something like that, it's hard to, um, it's hard to imagine. Um, and a lot of the habitat, of course, has been incur incurred upon um, to a pretty tremendous extent. Fortunately, there is still a lot left. Um, we also went to a city, the, the, the second hop on the, on the trip is to Cuiabá, which used to be a very sleepy little town. And as you can see, even that is not a sleepy little town anymore. It's a rapidly growing place. Um, from Cuiabá, you fly over open country up to Alta Floresta. Now, the, all the country you're flying over um, is, is kind of at one time sort of interesting and also kind of heartbreaking because you can only imagine here you are flying over what a, a generation ago would have been a heavily forested tropical river um, and it's no longer that. Um, anyway, we get to Alta Floresta. And Alta Floresta is the gateway to, well, the Floresta Amazona Hotel. That's about all there is in Alta Floresta, as far as I could figure. Um, this is the hotel. It's a, it's a very popular place with tourists, uh, with, with ecotourists. And I think if you're planning to go to the area, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, and it, since uh, in recent years, it's actually gotten quite fancy. It used to be very basic, but it's really gotten quite fancy and very tropical. And it's a, a very nice place to be. The staff is very attentive. Um, unless they're watching the football game, and then you can't find one when you need them, um, like if the power goes out. Now, why Alta Floresta, of all the places that there could be? This is the grounds of the place. It doesn't look very amazing. However, if you back up, this is the this is the actual lodge, and you see there's this very large wood lot. I guess it became famous originally because there were harpy eagles nesting in there. Um, still, um, there's a lot of wood lots about this size, you know, around the area. So it, it leads one to wonder, you know, what, what, what is it about this particular place? Well, the answer lies in its location. This is Alta Floresta, um, and it's right on um, the, the Telapiris, which is one of the larger uh, tributaries, southern tributaries off the Amazon. So there's a very easy flow of, of all kinds of Amazonian species up and down the river. Um, and, and, and so it, it, you get quite a good representation uh, of Amazonia, and it goes, most of it's going through what is still pretty much undisturbed areas. Um, nice place to stay. You get up in the morning and you kind of go out and you start looking and immediately run into moths that you have no way of identifying. I've showed it to some of my good moth friends. They have no way of identifying it. Uh, one said, you're kidding. Um, they have pretty moths. Um, and then you find what you want, your first butterfly, uh, except you, know, you look in the books and you can never find it. This is called a cane borer moth. Um, you find them kind of throughout the, the, the deep tropics, and you, they look enough like a butterfly, that, including the, you know, the apex, the, uh, you know, that you, that you go looking through the skippers to your, um, to your frustration. Okay, here we are on the back. This is now a swimming pool, but at the time it was a nice weedy lot. Um, and, and this is heaven for, uh, for local butterflies. Um, first though, in the morning you, you get birds, a numb bird. Uh, uh, scaly um, uh, ground dove, uh, parrot, I forget which parrot that is now, um, ruddy ground dove, you know, so you, you, have, you can't even get to the butterflies, but what the bird, you have to kick the birds out of the way. Um, and now I'm going to show a few pictures here of things you find in this kind of broken habitat that you're not going to find at a forested place like, uh, like uh, Cristalino. This is called an orcas checkered skipper. Um, put up your hand if you think you know what this looks like almost exactly, which is our common or tropical checkered skipper. Same genus, um, very similar looking, and they're, they're pretty, very, very common down there. Um, that's what they look like underneath. You could use that to distinguish them, but still they're, you know, they're very familiar. Um, 
You also get white skippers. This is a veined white skipper. They're common. You can get those in the, to the southern U.S., but they're very common throughout the tropics, and there's a number of species of them. But again, they're, they're not particularly forest butterflies. They're more open country butterflies. Um, you get your scrub hair streak. This is the case. This is the Asioka scrub, scrub hair streak. Um, and it's um, a very common. It's kind of in the same category, kind of as our gray hair streak or something, and being you know that kind of same habitat, very much of a generalist. Um, and Calephalus. Now, there's almost no way to tell these Calephalus apart. Um, even sometimes you can't even um, catch them and figure out what they are. So I just say Calephalus spa, but there's just lots and lots of different species of these down there. And, and this is, uh, some of you have been to Florida, some places seen a tropical buckeye. When you get into South America, the tropical buckeyes are put on much more of a dazzly show um, with, the, with the bright blue um, hind wing. Okay. In the woods around Alta Floresta, you can you begin to go out the first day or two and you find a lot of really neat stuff there. It's just full of butterflies. Um, uh, on the way out, you get a leopard moth, another moth, still in the morning, and you pick up a few friends who will be following you the rest of the day through your trip. Um, and this is the, these are essentially little yellows. You know, they're, they're a Eurema. They're called Alathea yellows. Um, and they're, they're, again, they're very common and there's a few different kinds of them. Uh, what I liked about this is here, they were forming a little crash. Um, this is where they, they'd all roosted sort of in the same area together um, overnight. Um, now, I'm not gonna show you many pictures from here because I'm gonna put them mostly in with the ones we're gonna see from, um, you know, from Crystallino. And I said, we're not gonna, I wasn't gonna show any dazzlies, just these simple things, but one snazzy one before we go, um, that's an Apollyona metal mark. Uh, an Apollonia party metal mark. Um, and that, that's, this is one of the reasons you go to Brazil. Okay, um, so we, you set out for Cristalino and you sort of go overland for a ways, um, nice habitat. Um, looks like it's open ranch country, um, uh, pretty tree, uh, trees, and you, you, but you do see some things along the way, roadside hawk, which are common down there, uh, burrowing owl, which is um, you know, commoner there certainly than it is here. Um, and you come up to the gate and, and the gate on the place basically um, says that you're now about to enter the um, Estrada particular, which means private property. Um, and then from this gate, you kind of drive this whole long road up until up to the river. Um, and at the river, you kind of have to cross over. So they bring out this nice boat, they put all your gear and everything and load you on to, to head up. Now, just to give you a sense of things, this is a, a, a silhouette of Manhattan Island, real size, uh, set on top of Cristalino area, um, you know, so that you get a, a sense of the of the scale, which is it's not gigantic, um, which is good actually, but it's but it's pretty it's pretty large. So you, you start up the river and you see you just immediately just I, I was just immediately captivated. It's one of the prettiest forests I've ever seen, um, and you see some things that you're familiar with if you've been around the U.S. You get anhinga. Oops, you're not so familiar with that. I don't imagine that's a capped heron. Um, so you keep we'll keep watching, and oh, you're well, you're a little bit, bit, but the green. I'll tell you, the green ibis is a whole lot prettier, you know, than a glossy. Got to tell you. And suddenly parrots fly over, and you know you're not in Kansas anymore. And and you get little parrots like a dusky billed parrotlet, and they'll they'll be eating the the um, the minerals off the off the shore. So you sometimes get those in very large uh, groups. And then of course my my favorite, which is the sun bittern which you'll find along the, the, the tree limbs. And then it doesn't like you, so he flies away. And finally, you get to Cristalino after all of this um, foo-for-a. And the minute you get off the boat, you realize why you've come here, because yes, there are a few butterflies around to, to greet you. Um, this is Cristalino. Um, uh, it's, it's an encampment um, you know, off at a river bend on, on, on the Telespiris. And um, it has a number of, it has a guest cabins and a, and a central area. Very, it's very nice. I, I'm pressing that because even though it's fairly expensive, it's a very comfortable place to stay. Um, and so for people who feel like people put off by the tropics, this is a good choice. And here's our, here's our little bungalow. And you know, uh, the places where you can go and visit and, and have uh, the food, God, the food is magnificently good. It's, it's excellent uh, food. Um, and, and our little inside bedroom. Now, of course, you have to be careful because there's people, there's things, not people, but you're being watched when you're in your bungalow. Um, here's a nosy monkey. But the one that really was unnerving um, was the 
barefaced Curacao caught in this case barefaced peeping in at us. Um, and you'd be sitting laying on your bed and up, up would pop the head. Um, and this is the, this is the Curacao. And I, I guess somebody must have fed it at some point because it felt it, it made itself very at home um, in the vicinity. Okay, so what is the commonest butterfly at Cristalino? You know, we're gonna see a lot of species. What's the commonest one? Um, the commonest one, you see the families of butterflies. So what group, I'm gonna give you a hint. It's an emphalid. That still leaves a lot of territory to cover. Um, and I'm gonna give you another hint, which is in the Biblinidae, or Biblinini, pardon me, um, which is the tropical admiral group. This is almost exclusively neotropical, and this is where some of our coolest butterflies are. Um, and I'm gonna give you another hint, which is it's in Unica, which means it's a purple wing. And this is it, the lovely thing. This is called a Pusilla or mousy um, purple wing. You think, well, that's not very much to look at. It does have a nice purple top on the bright ones. Um, and you can usually find one on top of your head if you're, if you're not careful, you know, hanging around. They're, um, they're, they're really pretty ubiquitous there. There he is. Okay, so let's go back to the, let's do a taxonomic tour because that's what we're gonna do for the rest of the time is kind of go through some families and give you a sense of what's involved with each of them. Um, one thing I wanna warn you though, is that around here, how do you learn butterflies? Well, you, fit, you find some of the common ones and you sort of say, this is, this is a this or that. And then you look for something else, which is you know, another version of this or that. Doesn't work so well in the tropics. This is a tiger mimic queen. This is a monarch relative. It's a Danaid, okay? Um, that's a monarch type. This is another monarch type, all right? You would, I mean, I'm sure you'd have known that instantly. Now, what about this? Ah, this is a crescent, okay? Obviously different. This is a heliconian, uh, related like to the zebra you'd get in Florida. This is an athomine. Uh, which is sort of vaguely related to the, um, which is sort of vaguely uh, related to the monarchs, but but in another distant group. This is another crescent. This is another athomine. So the conclusion from this, as you're getting started, is don't believe your lion eyes. Um, you know, you have to. The, some of these things you can learn by type, but there's a lot you're going to get fooled a lot of times trying to just figure out what in the heck it is you're looking at. The good part is they're pretty, so it doesn't matter that much. Anyway, so off we go to the to the jungles and then the, and the trails. There's a wonderful trail system at Cristalino through lots of different kinds of habitat. And one of the things you find here is giant fig trees. They're just huge things. And here's um, and also huge Brazil nut trees. And here's Emily and our guide showing the the uh, width of this giant fig tree. Now, people's people often say, "Aren't you afraid to go into the jungle?" I mean, aren't you afraid of the snakes and the piranhas and the, you know, and, and, and all the rest of that stuff and the spiders? And I say, no, actually, those aren't any problem. One of the things that is a big problem, though, is falling fig bombs, as they, as they call them. Um, these fig, these fig um, uh, uh, cannonballs um, weigh it, are very heavy. There's no understory, and so they drop straight down. One landed about five feet from Emily or less. If it had been five feet away, it would it would have clearly it would have cracked your skull. I mean, these are really these are that this, these you have to be afraid of. These are really dangerous. Uh, as far as animals go, well, here this is I'm sorry, this is an agouti. They're not they're not really very dangerous. Um, this is eating at the Brazil nuts on the on the ground. Um, now here's another one. Isn't this a cute little piggy? Okay, this is called a white-lipped peccary. This is perhaps the most dangerous creature that you will run into in most of the most of the Amazon jungle. Um, a pack of these things, the good part is you can smell them a mile away. The, the packs stink. Um, the, the, ba the bad part is if you get into one of those packs, they're very territorial. They will tear a full-grown jaguar to pieces in like 30 seconds. I mean, they're just, they, they, they are really, they're really rough customers. So don't, don't mess around with them. Okay, so let's start looking at things through a taxonomic lens then. Um, I'm going to start with some real simple things. There's only one kind of snout down there, just like there's only one kind of snout up here. And in fact, it's the same snout. Um, there's almost no blues. For those of you who like blues, um, you know, go to Arizona, you know, go to the Pacific Coast, something like that. This is about the only blue you get. It's a Cassius blue, although it doesn't look, it doesn't look like our Cassius blue, but that's, that's how it's uh, classified. Okay, well, that was easy, right? So we'll go on to the next thing. Okay, so now we're going to do whites and sulfurs. The, 
Pierrids, familiar, okay. So this is the Aletheia yellow, which we talked about before, which is like our little yellow, um, very common. Um, and then you start to get to the sea to the shore and you're going to see you have a whole lot of different Pierrids to deal with and many of them on the shoreline are um, uh, Pierrids. Um, so okay, does anybody want to do a quick ID on those? All right, I can see about four or five species. Let's go through them. This is called an apricot sulfur. It's like a large orange sulfur, same genus, um, very similar, but as you see it has this kind of mottly look, almost like it's got fungus growing on it or something in kind of a little pattern. Um, this is a statira sulfur, um, very the same species as you get in southern Florida, uh, same you know kind of yellow interior and white on the outside. Um, this is something you only get in the tropics, which is called a trite. I don't know why it's called a trite, but that it is. But it has a very distinctive. It's pale with a very distinctive uh, line going through it. This also is a white. You would not might not know that. Um, um, th this is in a, in a group of whites that actually is, is pretty highly colored. This is a group called Mel Whites, and there's you can get Mel Whites as far north as as northern Mexico, and they get into they get into Texas occasionally, um, but you get a lot more of them down as you get into into the the deep tropics, and and they're very often in, in kind of moist areas. Um, this looks like uh, this look, doesn't look too different, but this is a Florida white. This is the same species you could get um, in in southern Florida again, so that's universal. This looks like a Florida white, right? Looks pretty similar. Well, this is a completely different subfamily. This is called a mimic white. Um, this one just happens to look like the others. Although one way you can tell it um, is it has very, it has very curly or, or saggy um, antenna ends. Most of the mimic whites have gigantic hind wings. You see how big that hind wing is. When it comes out, it almost looks like a locust flying. The hind wing is even bigger sometimes than the than the fore wing. Um, and this, well, this is actually a moth. It's called a saffron playboy, but I think it's pretty, so I put it in. Okay, that's the that's all you have to that's all you have to know to figure out the Pierrids. What about hair streaks? Everybody likes hair streaks. Have they got any down there? Yep, they do. Some of them are pretty not too different than what you'd get here. This is a gentian hair streak. That's the top of it. It's large and pretty. Um, this kind of looks a little like a gray hair streak or something. Um, and um, it, I couldn't get it down to species because there's a number of them that look very similar. Um, this looks like an Asia hair streak, which you'd get in the Southwest, same, same genus, um, but there's a whole bunch of them when you get down further South. Um, this is an Eapsis, um, and, I, and Bob Robbins at the Smithsonian actually identified what it was because I couldn't find it very easily. That's a cool, that, uh, that is in my list of cool hair streaks. Um, the Heman hair streak is really common in a lot of places. Um, it's fairly large. Um, it has a very distinctive black dot at the uh, leading edge of the hind wing. Um, a number of green streaks, which again, you can get into South Texas, but this is the version down there. And finally, um, you know, does this, does this look familiar to anybody? I mean, I'm not saying you're going to get them in your backyard, um, but this is actually, it's a, this is an Atlides. It's, it's the same genus as the great purple hair streak. Um, with a certain, you know, uh, South American flair to it. You can see the red dots that you get on the great purple on the body. I mean, it, it's actually very similar, except for the, uh, obviously, the green coloration. Um, a few other hair streaks that you're not going to see around here. And a Selena hair streak, just shimmering. Uh, black spotted, which is a big, handsome hair streak. And finally, what I call the shark fin hair streak, which is very large and has kind of a swept back uh, forewing. Okay, so that's it on, on the hair streaks. You see there's a lot to look at and they're, they're, they're a lot of fun. What about swallowtails? I must get a lot of them down there. Well, most of the swallowtails in South America are kite swallowtails. They're like our zebra swallowtail in that same group. So here you get what's called the short line. They're called short line because these are considered short lines, okay? This is called a glaucus, although it doesn't even have any lines at all. So, and this line is just as short, but what the heck. One of the interesting things about these kite swallow tails, this four wing panel here is, tra is translucent. You can see right through it. Um, it doesn't have any pigment on it. Uh, one of the handsomer ones is the orange kite swallow tail, which is a, which is a kind of a brilliant orangey yellow color. Um, that, it's, it's a real standout. Never sits still, so it's a little blurry, but um, 
You also get, this is a ruby spotted swallowtail, very similar. It's a poisonous swallowtail, very similar to what you get um, in, 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 in Southern Texas. Some think it's the same species. Um, this is a cattle heart, which again, you get in Northern, up, up to Northern uh, Mexico. Um, this is called a bellus swallowtail. This is related to the pipe vine, interestingly enough, and, and the polydamus. And here's what, from the top, and there you can see it has some of the kind of same iridescence that a um, you know that a, a pipe vine might might have. One of the handsome ones down there is called a torquatus swallowtail. This is a big one, um, and it's it's really quite pretty. It's almost like a designer swallowtail. Um, somebody really had fun putting that one together. Um, and finally, this is a torquatus swallowtail. Um, uh, these are these are poison mimics. Actually, this is not a poisonous swallowtail, but it looks like one just to keep itself safe. All right, having enough of swallowtails, what about dagger wings? Now, dagger wings are really something down there. Have any have people have seen uh, ruddy dagger wings in Florida? Okay, okay. Well, now well, here's what we have down here. The commonest is mini banded dagger wing, which you which is kind of all over the neotropics. That's that's a pretty common one, um, but that looks pretty similar to the Norica hair streak. I'm sorry, the hair streak. What am I talking about? Dagger wing. Um, which except that the, the, you see the, the set of stripes is very dark up here. Um, then you go to the Orsilocus dagger wing, which is a real standout. And that's what it looks like underneath. And that one you can tell from the underneath real easily. Um, then here's the, this is their version of the ruddy dagger wing, which we get up north. Um, only it, it's much more crescent shaped than ours is, which is interesting. This has a different shape. And that's not to be confused, of course, with the Tutelina dagger wing which is not to be confused with the Barania drag dagger wing, um, but nothing could be confused with the Hermione uh, dagger wing, which I call the rising sun. It looks kind of like the Japanese flag to me, but what a, what, a, what, a piece, what a piece of design work that butterfly is. There's lots of different leaf wings and some of them will drive you insane from a, a identification standpoint, particularly since they don't sit still or open up very often. Okay, this is a kind of a standard um, a leaf wing mimicking, you know, mimicking leaves um, underneath, you know, and, and some of them amazing detail down to the seeming rust spots and things of that sort. Um, this is called an Oemaeus. I think that's how you pronounce it, leaf wing. Um, and this is one. This is one of the commoner ones. And I wanted to point out something. This one starts to open, and as it opens, it has kind of a purplish sheen, uh, iridescence-wise. As it opens further. This, the sheen, this is the same butterfly, the sheen turns blue. And one of the things that, that has, I found very confounding until I figured that out was that you'd say, well, this one's purple, it's not blue. And then you realize it's just because you're looking at it at the wrong angle is the only reason you made that mistake. Um, it, it's surprisingly difficult to identify um, a leaf wing that's perched on the end of your nose, by the way. That's not, a, that's, that's not easy. And I'm only glad that I had trimmed my nose hair that morning, oh God. Um, this is one of my favorites. This, this one really looks like a dead leaf, the Xenocrates leaf wing. It's not a very common one. Um, it's a, um, I don't know why some butterflies are my favorites, but this is, this is one of them. They have some really fancy ones like the tiger leaf wing, which isn't shaped like most of the leaf wings. And on the top, it, it, it looks almost like one of the um, uh, monarchs or something of that sort. Here's what it looks like underneath, very, very, very uh, shapely. And that's it for, the, for those. Now, metal marks. If you're in the tropics and you find something which after you've done all the work you possibly can do, small butterfly, and you don't know what it is, it's a metal mark, okay? Um, the only thing about metal marks is that they're, they're completely diverse as a group. So, okay, some of them are pretty simple. You can kind of tell this is a metal mark because it's roundness and that, that kind of looks almost like one of our metal marks. This is a, uh, you know, this is a standard, standard brand of metal mark. Um, you also get these synergous groups, which uh, oftentimes perch under leaves. And again, it has a general shape like the other, like the others. And this is another uh, species. These are these are not the same species, by the way. Those are different species. Um, and then you get some that are just altogether white on top, um, and they're 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 fun. Again, usually they're they're underneath leaves. Um, does that? Um, Actually, I think actually I, I know I was on I was on my back taking this picture. It was under a leaf. Sorry. 
Um, this is about this is one of the blue metal marks, a black patch metal mark. You find some of these in the U.S., um, but the, you find many of them down there. Fortunately, it, there's only a one or two at, at Crystallino species, and they're they're very pretty underneath. Um, this is a different species. See, of course, that's not to be confused with this. Naturally, um, you can figure that out immediately. Um, and then you get the Theodora metal mark. This is oh god, this is one of my favorite. I mean, Dior should um, copy this. Um, here's an Amaranthina metal mark, very nicely designed. And this is one of everybody's favorite, which is the Starry Night metal mark, which is, uh, you know, like, like one of the most amazing creatures uh, you can possibly imagine, including these little tips here, kind of blue in color. And then these others are, are, are white. It's just a, when you get one of these that are fresh like this, it's just really a fantastic butterfly. Um, you get, uh, this is a whole group that look like this. This is the female, this is the male. Um, um, uh, Riodina, they're called. And this is pretty common throughout the Neotropics, but it's still one of the more dazzling butterflies. This is a Manaria, an Amaranthus Manaria or a Manaria metal mark. It's also pretty underneath, but you don't have to see that because the top is pretty enough by itself. Some of the some of the ones that people really go out for are the Ancelorus, uh, which are um, very brightly colored and um, uh, very uh, very highly marked. And maybe the maybe the crowning one in this group is the uh, Reduses, or the swallowtail metal marks. Um, and this is a Reduce periander, um, which um, well speaks for itself. I really particularly like the fact that it even has the iridescence on the on the on the upper carapace, which is kind of amazing. Now, you still, while you're in the metal marks, that you get the semimesias. I'm just going to run through semimesias for a second because you now keep your eyes open because you know there's going to be a quiz. Um, here's the here's the croceus, and this here's a mating croceus. Now, one of the problems with these is the males and the females look very different, and the males of all the species look alike, and the females of all the species look alike. You know, so it's you know you're kind of stuck. Um, this is a mesosemia, um, where the dot pattern here is a little different. Of course, I mean, how, how could you possibly be confused? This is also a mesosemia. This is a mesosemia. This is a mesosemia. This isn't a mesosemia, but it's pretty anyway. It's called a, a white dash a mesine. Um, a, a calliope metal mark. Another calliope metal mark. Not a calliope metal mark. This is an atletipa. There's hundreds of atletipas. And this, of course, is a, is a Sirota or a jewel mark, um, which you can get, again, in, in Mexico and some places like that and all through the tropics. Um, these, these things are just tiny, tiny butterflies. Um, and you can, they're frequently underneath leaves. Um, and you just always want to find one of those if you possibly can. And then there's the uh, carias, which are, they're the same as our, um, we have a couple of carias up in our area, like the scallop winged um, uh, metal mark in the, in the Southwest. But this one is again more highly colored than anything you'll find in the United States. This is called a quilted metal mark. I call it a quilted metal mark, just to go to just to show you another bit of variety. Now, now that we've gone through the metal marks, are you can't you aren't don't you feel confident that you'll be able to identify a metal mark next time you see one? Um, you know, <laughs> all very similar. I mean, you know, when you've seen once you've seen them one, you've seen them all. Okay, crescents. Fortunately, there's not too many crescents. Um, this crescent looks a little bit like some of the ones you'd find, um, at least in the uh, northern Neotropics. This is a crescent that almost looks something like you might find around here. You know, that, that's kind of good. So that this is called uh, an, or an Ortilla crescent. Ortilla crescent. Um, and this, this is another crescent, right? No, this is a metal mark. It just looks like a crescent, just for fun. I don't know, nobody knows why it looks like it, but it does, just does that for fun. And here is the crescent metal mark from uh, field crescent metal mark from the top. Um, so you always have to be a little careful because you're liable to get fooled. Um, here's another crescent, and this one looks just like a heliconian. So again, that don't you know? Um, don't believe your lion eyes. Passion vine butterflies are big throughout the tropics, um, and the, you've seen a lot of these in butterfly houses in different places. They're very dazzling. The problem with them is they intermate and, and they um, and they crossbreed and do all sorts of other stuff. So the species are really hard on them. Um, this is a, a Bernie's long wing. Now, that's a common one at, at Cristalino. Um, this is a raid long wing. These are the rays, I guess. Um, 
and that's the well those are the raised two and this is the underside um this is a passion vine we only have a few passion vines up here there's all kinds of passion vines down there they have plenty of food to eat and this makes them poisonous um uh, this is a uh, um uh, it's a heli it's a i don't know it's a heliconian um and it's called pneumata um which are a cali and i'm i'm 90 percent sure of the idea on this but they're so they're really complicated Another group that's related to these are the, are, are the silver spots. This is called a Juno silver spot. Um, and it has a, a, and it looks very colored underneath. Now this is similar to what we'd see up here um, in, uh, you know, um, you know we, we, we could see some of these uh, in, in our area of re close relatives. Down there though, you, you'll find that one, one of the relatives in that group is called the Julia which is our Julia, St. Julia. They also have a Julieta, however. Here's the, uh, here's the Julia, here's the Julieta. So, you know, you gotta get used to that difference. Um, green butterflies, they have some green butterflies in this group. This is called a green long wing, all right? Is that, is that familiar with anything you've ever seen? Yes, it's familiar, I'm gonna, as I'm throwing over, it's familiar with the malachite group. This is not a malachite. This is a malachite. It's easy, you know, you just have to get used to it. Now this group is the malachites and the beauties. Um, this is a fancy group. Um, the, the Orion is a big butterfly. It's like eight or eight inches tall or something. You know, when, when it's around, you really know it's there. Um, but, the, but the king of, the, of this group is called the Jacunda, which is obviously for Jagunda. Um, I mean, and it's just a huge butterfly. And it comes down to river sides. And when it opens up, my Lord, is it a huge butterfly and it's very flashy. There's also beauties, the Dursey beauty. Um, and, and this is called the Geppettis beauty. This is the Geppettis beauty from below. Now this is of course, easily distinguished from the uh, Duacillian beauty, which is easily distinguished from the Amazon beauty. Um, no problem there. Everybody got that? Okay, good, we'll move on. And that's the Amazon beauty from above. I mean, half the fun is seeing these things, and then the other half is the is the fun of trying to sort them out. Okay, you have all been very good, and so you know, I'm going to now give you a five minute break period, so just to kind of stretch. And I will um and I will kind of cool my vocal cords for a moment. By the way, I'll I will take some questions now if anybody is, has any questions at the moment. Okay. Yes, yeah, Rick. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. What did you say? What did you call that super abundant purple wing? Pusilla. Uh, it's a, a Unica Pusilla. And it okay. lives like for mouse, mousy. <laughs> All right. Kind of mousy gray is, what, is where the name comes from. Huh. Okay. They're not always the commonest butterfly there, but they very often are. Yeah. That's the one that was landing on us out in the boat. Sitting oh, yeah? On us, sitting on our sweaty foreheads. Oh, yeah. They, that's the other reason that you notice them is because they, they, uh, they like human sweat quite a lot. And by, and by the way, that's a very common commodity <laughs> in the woods there, <laughs> I might say. I'll start in a couple minutes, but um, what camera equipment are you guys using? Well, in this trip, uh, I was trying to go light because I, this was just before I had my uh, ankle work done, and um, and so I was using I was actually using a Nikon D three hundred for the most part with a, usually a 200 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. And the thing is the lens is the more important part because it was, it's a really good lens, it was a really good lens. Um, I don't use any, either of those anymore, um, but um, they, they worked okay there. I mean, you know, they, they, they didn't break down, you know, so that was the, that's the main thing is it's, it's really hard. It's really hard out there on camera equipment, as you can imagine, you know, the flashes and the, um, you know, the lenses, the whole thing, it's just, it's really hard on them. I mean, that, that would be your nightmare as you get out there and you'd be, if you have crept up on your favorite butterfly and then bango, <laughs> your camera won't work. All right. 
So, mm, two minutes. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I'll take a poll afterwards as to how many people this makes want to go to the Brazil versus how many people it intimidates the heck out of. <laughs> Actually, it's it's so totally worth it. I mean, it's a it's just a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful adventure. <clears throat> I'll put in a bigger plug for Cristalino. We yep. were there. We were there for about 10 days in 1999. It was the most spectacular uh, rainforest area we've been in anywhere in South America. You know, you know who else said exactly the same thing, Mike, was Kim, Kim Garwood. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's been all over there looking for, um, you know, looking for tropical butterflies. And, and she said that, you know, that, that, is, that she considers that the best, um, you know, uh, a prime, you know, primitive forest, or you know, prime, uh, you know, prime uh, rainforest that she knows of. And we had we had taper sightings every time we went up the river. Yeah, we had the. Uh, it's the only place I've ever seen brockets. It was incredible, absolutely yeah. incredible. Uh, hi, Joanne. How are you? Fine. How are you? Good. Yeah, it was. It it it's it, it. The place takes your breath away, and I'm just and I'm doing a I'm doing a, a jet plane tour through the butterflies and there's so much else to see there it's it's really phenomenal okay let's let's finish her off here everybody everybody back in the seat if not don't tell me okay next group is called the proponas um and the proponas are a um um hang on uh, the proponas are um, a group. They're they actually are in South Florida now. They're they're kind of a large nymphalid butterfly, and most of them have this kind of blue uh, marking above them, and they're dark underneath. Almost all of them are either plain or have this two toned uh, character. They're they've got also a very I think like their eye has a has a lot of cool iridescence to it. Um, and this is what a typical propona. This is the one spotted. Um, this is what a typical proponent looks like. They're not very, um, you know, they're not very flashy, but they're um, they're big and they're they're kind of noticeable. Now, this is not a proponent, but I thought I would throw something in other than a than a butterfly. This is called a plant hopper. This is a nymph of a plant hopper, little teeny tiny thing. You almost can't even believe you're seeing it. And when this grows up, it's going to be some something you would not want in your garden, which is called a flatted plant hopper. These things are sitting there, not just showing off, they're sitting there sucking the juices out of this tree. Um, and if they get into your orchard, you're, you know, you're in, in tough shape. They're a little bit like a lantern fly, you know. Um, so you you so admire them at a distance, but don't invite, don't, don't bring any home. The 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 classiest group of butterflies, perhaps, in the in the Neotropics, and one of the real landmarks is the what I call the biblids or the bladinini. Um, and, and and the emperors and then um, th I've saved this group for this th to talk about at this stage. This is called an, an olive wing or an abrinus olive wing, but most people just call them olive wing. Um, that's the um, uh, male above. I'm sorry, that's that's the female above. That's the male above. Okay, um, it's very hard to get the up top the top shot. I'll tell you, but um, you know they're just they're they're big and they're just amazing to look at. This is a bunch of biblids. Um, well, they're at poo, but what you know that that's what they're that's to each their own. Um, and you know they just they, you can see the whole constellation of the rainbow there. Now, this is called a catone. There's a bunch of different catone species up and down. This is one of the to me. This is one of the subtlest. Uh, on top, though, it looks completely different. It's an orange barred catone, and they're you know, they they frequently are jet black on top with a big br a bright orange mark to them. Um, this is an orange banner. Orange banner is common throughout the Neotropics. It's one of the commoner butterflies you will see. Um, and here's what it looks like underneath. Um, and here's another one. Oh no, wait, that's a <laughs> that's a leaf wing uh, that just happens to look an awful lot like it. Um, you always gotta you always gotta be careful. See, I'm keeping you awake. You know, you know, I'm not letting you drift off. 
This is called a little banner. It's a very cute little job, but the really nice one is that underneath, it's very fancy. Um, this one's shy, however, it doesn't want to let us see it. Uh, this is a Thecla banner, which is very common, but unfortunately it's one of the least um, spanky of the group. Also in this group is the crackers. This is a variable cracker. Somebody had a little bit of, it took a bite out of the cracker. And this is a brownish cracker, which is very common there as well. But the thing you really want to go to the to the tropics for, um, one of those things that I looked for for a long time before I could get a nice shot of it, is the Starry Night Cracker, um, which is which rivals the Starry Night Metal Mark um, for being like a really dazzly butterfly. A bunch of 88s. Now, some of you may have seen 88s in the U.S. Uh, you know, in, in the West. Um, now, this is called the Starty 88. This is very common at at Cristalino. This is what it looks like on top. Here is a different uh, 88 here um, with a different view. This is a uh, Clamina 88, which is very similar. You can see why it's called 88 now. Although this one is often called an 89 because instead of looking like two eights, it looks like a nine. So, you know, people, people get really run out of imagination after a while. Um, this is called a blind 88. I'm not sure why, maybe because it doesn't have much pattern. It doesn't look like much underneath. It looks quite like something up above though. The very, uh, that same butterfly. And this is a, this is the Hisdaspes above. They're, you know, they, the, these ones tend to flash when they're, when they're mating, uh, but otherwise they're being, they're cryptic below. Related to them is the sailors, the dynamines. We get, we get some sailors in South Texas and places, but the, the pale sailor is really handsome. Um, and, and this is a, this is not, this is, these are different species. Um, this is a ghost sailor. Um, this is an arene sailor. And these are all in, in the same area. I mean, you have to be able to tell these apart. Um, and there's an, um, there's an, uh, a ghost sailor and arene sailor together on my sweaty camera uh, bag and another arene, um, another ghost. This looks like one of those, except this is a purple wing. Why do they call it a purple wing? It's not purple. Here it is underneath. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a raid purple wing underneath. It's not purple, it's not purple above. So you can't go by the purple so much. Um, the plain purple wing, now that one you can get somewhere. That one does have an iridescent upper surface. Um, and now you get the, what you call the Agatha Emperor. This isn't a purple wing at all. This is an emperor, um, you know, so the, you know, so what are you gonna do? The thing, one way you can tell the emperors, which is helpful, is look at that nice green proboscis. Very few butterflies have a green proboscis like that. And you can't go to the tropics without army ants. Aren't those appealing? And where you got army ants, what are you gonna find? Well, ant birds, of course. Following the, you know, following the horde. Uh, this is the first time I ever actually photographed an, an ant bird following, um, you know, actually following an army ant herd. Owls are, uh, are we're getting some of the bigger nymphalids toward the end of the, the thing. The owls are, um, there, there's three or four of them. They're very large. They perch on the sides of trees. They generally keep their wings shut. Um, and they are generally, they're pretty, but, you know, um, there's only one that I really think is fancy, and that's the bia owl, which is smaller, but it has kind of a nice shape and incredible uh, reticulations on it, which I think are very lovely. Morphos, everybody likes morphos. Um, there are several species of morphos down there. There's a common, or the common morpho is actually a brown morpho, um, and it's, it's just kind of plain. The, hel the, the Helenor morpho is very nice underneath, very common, and it has the kind of blue stripe above. This is the Menelaus morpho, which people are familiar with. I couldn't get one to sit down while I was there, but this is a shot from the web, um, you know, which is what they look like. This is the one everybody associates with when they, when they say morpho. And we saw a bunch of them, but they just, they just fly and fly and fly. They never sit down. And that's the Achilles morpho is another one. There's the Achilles on top. So you see, that's, a, that's, that's that group. Now, the sisters. I could talk about sisters for a long time. I won't. Instead, I'm going to give you a visual IQ test. Okay, you got your pencils and paper ready. Okay, this is a pleasure sister from the bottom. They all look pretty similar from the bottom. 
and I might say whoever called this a pleasure sister, they've spending been spending too much time in the in the Amazon, I think. Um, so this is the pleasure sister. This is the um, Capunica skipper, Pinus. This is the Cocala skipper, I said skipper, I mean sister. Um, this is another. This is another. This is called the pointer sister. You know why? Because it's got a point there. So they call it a pointer sister. Like, <laughs> okay. Aren't they got, got that now? You, can you be able to tell all those in the field? Okay. Um, and then finally you get this one. This one you might be able to tell because it has little blue tails. Unfortunately, it's not a sister, it's an emperor again. It's a female um, Linda emperor, um, which is kind of mimics them. This one you can at least tell. This is a Mesentina sister. And it has a big, huge orange patch. So at least that one, you can tell what the heck you're looking at. And the red-throated piping guan just sits up there and says, I don't care. They all taste the same to me. OK, satyrs. They have some interesting satyrs down there. This is a, a blue satyr. Um, this is another, except no, I'm sorry, that's a hair streak, which mimics the blue satyr. One of them mimics the other. I don't know which mimics which. Um, just to keep it, keep you on your toes as tails. They have a lot of satyrs, lots and lots and lots of satyrs that look a little bit like our, our you know, common wood nymphs or, or like our, our wood satyrs, one or the other. Um, and, and you get whole, whole rafts of these. And they're very hard to tell apart. Then you get this one. This is a metal mark again. This isn't even a satyr at all. This looks like a satyr, but it isn't. Um, then you get a group of really big satyrs called tagetuses. Um, the tagetuses are really handsome, big butterflies. Um, they're not very colorful, but they're interesting. And then you get a whole bunch of really idiosyncratic, weird um, satyrs down there. Um, I mean, who would have thought that would you get a satyr that would look like anything that would look like that? Forget a satyr um, or this. Deep in the forest, you get the uh, Pirella butterflies. They've been studied by geneticists quite a lot. Um, they're very, they're very thin uh, winged and very, and 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 they flit around um, uh, very lightly on their wings. Um, this one has is has some color on the top, um, and then finally the the one that, that that everyone really looks for is this, which has no color at all. This is the one of the most clear clear winged butterflies you'll ever see, um, and that's again that's one of the favorites of the trip um, to 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 get one of those to finally sit down. It's also hard to see them because they're practically invisible in the forest. Skippers finally, when you get to the skippers, you know you're almost getting to the end. So they have a lot of spread wing skippers. Um, they have a hermit skipper, which is common in the, down there. They have a, a Pelargy skipper, that's pretty common. And then you get a whole bunch of bent wings and things like that, which look like this or like this. This isn't this isn't there's different species. This is a variegated skipper. Um, this is a spur wing, named for that little whoop, that little spur on the wing. Um, this is a common spur wing. You can see the spur pretty easily there. And then you get um, uh, tufted skippers. Um, which are, you know, which at least you can, they have a nice color to them. And you get some really um, delicate things like the bent skipper, um, the pusilla skipper, um, this priasa skipper, which I think is, I God, wish we could get on a closer picture. That's a gorgeous butterfly. Um, this, was, this was upside down under a leaf. Um, there's a white spotted skipper, um, a flat. And this is a, a scarlet eye. It does have a scarlet eye, and that's because you tend to find these generally at dusk or dawn, um, because they're, um, they, you know, they, the the red pigment helps them see better, you know, in, in very low light. Um, and so that, and so you'll find them coming to flowers almost like a sphinx moth like, uh, very late in the day. Um, silver drops. There's a lot of species. I don't know what this is. They're very much obviously like our silver spotted skipper, but they got a bunch of different ones down there, and they have gemadias. Uh, which you get again in Texas, and people have seen these. There's lots and lots of different species of them. One cool species is called a brilliant anastris. Now you notice again, this is purple. Remember I talked about purple? What do you think it's going to look like when the wings open? Blue. <laughs> you know, it just goes to show you got to be careful about your colors. And finally, the variable blue skipper. If you can do better for a spread wing skipper than that, let me know and I'll go find it with you. Now, grass skippers, very short on grass skippers. There's thousands of grass skippers that look like that, okay? Um, sometimes you can tell them what they are. A lot of times you can't tell what they are. Um, there's a whole group that in the forest that use white stripes to break up their pattern so they're harder to see in the forest. 
you get you get several of those and some of them are kind of interesting but that's a kind of a common theme that you get and salianas which there's many species of can't really tell them what count them apart um, they also use a you know kind of a broken pattern uh, to conceal themselves so just in case you think that all the skippers are pretty drab i just wanted to leave by saying skippers are not always drab some of them are actually quite pretty um, when you when you get a close look at them and Kuhn, now we're headed home, finishing up, um, saying goodbye, leaving down the river. Um, and one of the things you have to see before you leave Cristalino is the giant river otters. Now, isn't that cute and adorable? You could just go up and give it a hug. Well, go up and give it a hug, and, and but do that before you watch it eat a fish. Not, not, quite, not quite so cuddly when you see how they actually behave. And the Curacao is saying, yuck, <laughs> kind of like that at all. So we headed off into the end of the end of the sunset, um, stopped by a, a local waterfall. Here are all the people, the, the actual Brazilians having a wonderful time by the waterfall and saying, see you guys later. And back to remembering uh, the times by the riverside. And that is it. You all get a gold star on your forehead for getting through all of those species. Okay, any, any, could there possibly be any questions? <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I've got a question here. Yep. As, as uh, I noticed you have common names for most of them. Uh, where do they come from and are they reasonably stable? Um, you can sit here, sit down. Well, they come from a variety. There are some of them that have, um, traditional names that go back years, things like the Orion um, and, and some of the, and, and like the Julia and things like that. They have long established common names um, that they've had for a very long time. <clears throat> a lot of them have been, have had names coined for them fairly recently, um, you know, in the last few years. And one of the people who coins them, uh, in addition to myself sometimes, um, is Kim Garwood. And she has a series of books on the Neotropics and, and, and stuff. And, and she believes that, you know, that you, you want to have a, a lot of these things, the common name really helps. Um, and some, and then look, you know, taxonomy these days, the common name is often now um, more stable than the, than the scientific name. You know, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the tropical butterflies are no less susceptible to the taxonomy being flipped all over the place than, you know, than birds or some of these other creatures are, you know. And so um, I, I always just find it, I, I find people grasp things better if they have a really, um, evocative common name for things. And, and God knows these are hard enough to keep straight anyway. Uh, some of them, I'm sure you won't, I'm sure you could just, if I showed them to you, I'm sure you'd rattle the names off right away, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, Rick, I've been in the tropics a couple times down in uh, South America mm -hmm. with, uh, um, can't think of her name. The gal you were just talking about. Okay, and I wonder when you go yourself, how, yes, um, how, what can you use to identify them if you haven't been with a leader? I've been well, bird travels and I've done a lot of butterfly photographing. Okay. Um, Crystalino is, the, one of the reasons I picked Crystalino for this, I and mean, when we've gone to it a bunch of different places, <clears throat> is that it has you can do packages there and they will kind of, you know, help you get there. I mean, the, I mean, the first thing is, you know, you're, you know, you, you have a couple of stops and you have to get to where you're going, you know, so, and they're good at that. And, and the other thing is, um, I, you saw that one picture of, of Emily and the, and the, and the guide uh, at the fig tree that um, he's, he's a Belgian fellow um, and he's learning about butterflies now. Uh, at the time, what, the problem with any of these places, Crystal, you know, very much among them used to be that you'd go out and the, and the guy said, oh, you know, a formulated uh, tube top, you know, and, and we're sitting down there shooting something on the ground. And some of the bird guides would actually get, um, would, would actually get angry with us, you know, because we weren't paying attention to some fly catcher or, or you know, or something else that they found. Um, and, and a lot of them have started, uh, you know, a lot of them have started. We, we, we taught him as much as he taught us on that trip, but he knew where the habitats were and he knew where a lot of things were. And he, was, he wasn't a beginner, he wasn't a complete beginner, but he didn't know the fine points at that stage. So you need to be ready 
to find someone who can get you the right habitats, knows pretty much what they're doing, um, and then who, um, uh, you know, who, you may, if you've been there a couple of times, you've been with Kim, you have some of her books, I'm assuming, you know, you can start filling it in. And then what you do is take as many pictures as you can. Um, you know, this, this trip was 2014. I didn't start showing it until about 2019. Um, because I couldn't identify all the stuff until then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, a, it, it, it's one week in the tropics in a couple of years, uh, you know, trying to figure out what each of the things are. Okay. I mean, it's a real, it's a real scavenger hunt. After it is a difficulty, yes. But that's the fun of it. I mean, yeah. if that's the fun of it, then to be able to sort of show it and say, well, here's, here's all of these things. Yeah. And some of them are pretty great. I love it. Oh, yeah. Anybody else? What field guides do you use? Well, Kim Garwood has a series of field guides. I don't have one handy. Um, just look up Kim Garwood. Um, and you know, it's one of those things. It's, there's, it's not even, you, 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 you kind of have to, it, it's kind of like birding back 50 years ago. Um, you know, there's not one source that just you go to and you say, oh, here is this, here's that. Um, you know, you have to be kind of an old time naturalist a bit. You know, and you have, and that to me, that's actually that's what I live for. I mean, I, that that's half of the fun of it, you know, is to actually find this stuff and and actually figure it out yourself. And so you may be kind of cross referencing. Um, now I, I'm a I'm an affiliate curator up at uh, Yale Peabody, and uh, the, a number of the things I went and I looked at their collection, um, and in certain cases they actually had some of the stuff in the collection that um, you know that I could look at and that helped me with some of the IDs. That doesn't always work. Uh, particularly in North American collections. Uh, and then sometimes I would write people things, um, you know, or I, and there's another, <clears throat> there's people down at the McGuire Center in, in, in Florida, uh, including, I, I would say, Keith Wilmot um, yeah. and, and, and some of the others. And, 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 and Keith is, he spends most of his time in Ecuador, but he's just brilliant. And there's a bunch of those guys down there who, do, who are doing absolutely fabulous neotropical butterfly work. Uh, you know, kind of research and canvassing and things like that. And he'll be able to get you on the, you know, um, I, I, I use him very sparingly because he's very busy and an important fellow, but um, I, you know, um, I know him pretty well. So if I have something that's puzzling me, I can ask him. It's usually something that's of some interest to him because if I can't figure it out after all the work, then it's probably going to be something that he'll find a little bit interesting anyway. So it's kind of like, um, I, had a, I had a lawyer ask me that same question recently, you know, how do you, um, you know, how do you, you know, learn these things? And I said, well, look, you're a lawyer. He said, what, what book do you go to for your law? No, you, you're in the community, you know, and you, you know, you kind of hear things and you learn things and you learn something from one person and nothing from another person. It's kind of that, it's, it's kind of an immersion experience really is, is yeah. what it comes down to. Any other questions? I have one. Rick, what would be the best time to go if you wanted to see these most most of these butterflies i would check well, I, I can give you names of some of the people who go there regularly i would check i think july i think well, we were july well that was fine july was good um i think it's it, it's kind of a wet season dry season thing down there obviously they don't really have seasons as such um you know like like we have this is not it's never going to get real cold um but uh, uh you know the um you, i think you want to be there you, you know, it's like any, you don't want to be there after, you know, in the middle of a huge drought or, or something like that. Mm. And by the way, I checked and it's still, it's still um, in, in decent shape. It's not, you know, there've been a lot of troubles in the Amazon lately, but this, it's still going, it's going concern. Knock Thank on you. wood, <laughs> as they say. Okay. Thank you. Have I, have I worn everybody to a complete frazzle now? I think you've just whetted everybody's appetite to want to just get south and just see some of those amazing creatures. If you haven't done the Neotropics, by the way, I would start with like Mexico or, you know, or, or, some, or some other places um, that, are, that are accessible, Panama or some of, some of those other spots, because it, it, can be, it can be bloody overwhelming. You know, and if you, if, I, I, I wouldn't recommend, unless you're with somebody who knows exactly what they're doing, I wouldn't recommend jumping into the deep end you know, right away. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's just a lot to, there's a lot to, to see there. Okay. You know, I've traveled with Andrew Neal and uh, I had a couple of very good trips with him. Mm -hmm. He's excellent. Yeah. 
Well, that would maybe send. I, I'd like to. I've heard of him. I'd like to. If you have any information on him, I'd like to see that. That would be useful. I have. He's in. He's in England. I have yep. uh, yep. an uh, email address for him. Would you like it? Yes, please. Yeah, a, lo okay. a lot of the neotropical people are from Europe or England. They're, a lot of them are not. Yeah. Uh, weirdly, they're not from here. Yeah. But okay. That, that's what. It, that's how it goes. Have to go. I'll get it. that to you. Great. Thanks very much, Aileen. No problem. Okay. Well, what a what a good group. I was it was fun to fun to share some of this stuff. I hope it um, I hope it hit approximately the right level for people. It was perfect. Thank you so much, Rick, okay. and thank you everyone for coming tonight. Just remember, we don't have a a meeting like this for July and August. We'll have a Zoom meeting in September, but July we've got plenty of field trips. We've got Fourth of July butterfly counts, um, and we'll have our picnic. Hopefully the weather will cooperate and we'll get to see each other on August 14th. And we will get some more information out to you in the email blast for those 4th of July counts. Great. So stay well, everybody. Get outside. Enjoy nature. Thank Thanks, you so everyone. much. Good Thank night. You. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Very good. Enjoy that. Wow. Oof. That was uh, a lot. <laughs>